Greetings, friends. My name is Goldie Hertz, and I'm proud to be the chair of the American Society for Yad Vashem inaugural speaker series. And I'm Michelle Bernstein, and I'm the vice chair of the inaugural speaker series. On behalf of ourselves and our co-chair, Michelle Tarragon, and everyone at the American Society for Yad Vashem, we thank you for joining us for our third speaker series program, Spiritual Survival, Art During the Holocaust with Eliane Moray Rosenberg, Curator and Art Department Director of the Yad Vashem Museum Division. A special thank you to our generous sponsors whose names were listed at the beginning of this program. As we all know, the global coronavirus pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges. The symbolism of Holocaust remembrance during this time is deeply significant. The lessons of the Shoah, lessons of hope and resilience, have never been more relevant. Along with the entire ASYV and Yad Vashem family, we extend our best for the safety and well-being for each of you and your loved ones. Our speaker series was launched this winter to bring Yad Vashem's critical work in Holocaust remembrance and education directly to you in order to explore some of today's most important and pressing issues through the unique lens that only Yad Vashem can provide. While originally planned as a New York tri-state event, we are delighted to bring this online program to the entire ASYV community. We thank you for joining us and for your continued involvement with ASYV and Yad Vashem, especially during this unprecedented time. As you view this special program, we welcome your feedback. If you have any questions for Mrs. Marie Rosenberg, please send them to Emily Snyder at Yad Vashem. We look forward to hearing from you. And please stay tuned and watch your inbox for more ASYV events online and in person. Since its founding 67 years ago, Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, has become synonymous with Holocaust commemoration and education. Through its landmark Holocaust History Museum, comprehensive archives, International School for Holocaust Studies, and so much more, Yad Vashem brings the memory of the Shoah to the far corners of the world. With programs including the training of hundreds of thousands of educators from across the globe, to share the lessons of the Holocaust with their students and the digitization of millions of documents and survivor testimonies, it is our mission to ensure that the atrocities committed by the Nazis and their collaborators are never forgotten and never repeated. As a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, I am committed to doing everything I can to ensure that the world never forgets the atrocities of the Holocaust and the past is never repeated. That is why I am involved with ASYV and Yad Vashem and why I appreciate everyone making the time to participate in this very special program. Eliad Moray Rosenberg is a curator and art department director of the Yad Vashem Museums Division. She received her master's degree in art history from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and completed museum studies at the Tel Aviv University. An expert on Holocaust related art Eliad Moret Rosenberg and her team has conducted substantial research on the art of artists persecuted and murdered by the Nazis, rescuing artists from oblivion, and making their unique visual testimonies known to the world. Thank you again for joining us and best wishes for everyone's health and safety. I am now delighted to turn the program over to Eliad Moret Rosenberg. Welcome to the Holocaust Art Museum at Yad Vashem. I would like to invite you to a special tour here at the Art Museum. I will be talking about art that was created during the time of the Holocaust, spiritual survival. We start with a quote. It's from Gela Sechstein's Last Will. She lived in Warsaw, she was a talented artist, and she was active in the Warsaw Ghetto. In her last will, she wrote, as I stand on the border between life and death, certain that I will not remain alive, I wish to take leave from my friends and my works. My works I bequeath to the Jewish Museum to be built after the war. Farewell, my friends, Farewell, the Jewish people. Never again, Allah, such a catastrophe. And you see that Gela Sachstein did not survive. She was murdered like all of her family. But her artworks did survive. 
and through these artworks, we are able to tell her story. This museum is dedicated to all the artists who, like Gela Sachstein, left behind artworks or that created art during the Holocaust. Through these artworks, we are telling their stories, we are learning about their world, and we are we try to understand how, under such dreadful circumstances, they were able to keep their spirit alive. Here you can see a painting which survived by Gerda Sachstein. Nothing in the topic of this artwork tells us about the tragic fate of Gela. And of course, this painting was done during the 30s. It's a still life with apples, flowers, and a self-portrait. It's from before the war, it's from the 30s, but it was given by the artist to her husband's family that lived in Israel. This is how it survived, and this is how it reached us. Through this painting, we are, we are able to tell a bit about Gela Sachstein to honor her memory. The subject of my talk today is spiritual survival. Here we have a very special item in our collection uh, done by Pavel Fantin in the Theresienstadt ghetto somewhere in 1943s. And we see Hitler depicted as a buffoon in a harlequin costume. Look at his hands that are filled with blood and you can see the guitar, a broken guitar is also full of blood. And Hitler is depicted as a drunken man. And the title of this work is The Song is Over. So Pavel Fanten in the Theresienstadt ghetto wishes that all this nightmare will end, that this bloody melody will stop. Can you imagine what it takes for a man to create such a subversive art while he is himself imprisoned? Now, Pavel Fantel was not by training an artist. He was uh, a physician, a doctor, fighting against typhus in Theresienstadt. But, but during his free time, he would paint, he would draw satirical drawings, sometimes very, very critical drawings about life in the ghetto. And um, we have to bear in mind what great risks this man took. And he will understand, I think, better. When we talk about spiritual survival, here we see a man that is ready to risk his life, but just to maintain his spirit free. Pavel Fantel was taken, uh, deported to Auschwitz, and he ultimately was um, murdered on a death march. His works survived because a friend of his, a non-Jew, working at the railroad station in Theresienstadt, took his drawings, about 80 drawings, and hid them in his home. After the war, these works were given to Pavel Fantel's mother, who did survive the war. And she took these works and donated them to Yad Vashem. In the Theresienstadt ghetto, there was a great uh, cultural activity in spite of the very difficult conditions of internment. And uh, artists depicted this uh, amazing uh, cultural life that took place there. And what you see here uh, is a wall dedicated to the musicians. And I would like to talk in particular um, about Max Placzek, 
who did a series of portraits of musicians. Um, now, Max Blachek in Theresienstadt, in a little more than a year, completed more than 550 portraits. Unbelievable. And when we think about why did he create so many portraits, we cannot say it's just a coincidence. He wanted to leave a trace. He wanted to leave a trace of the people surrounding him, of this amazing uh, of people coming from Central Europe. A lot of them were part of the cultural elite of Europe. And all of a sudden, they were there in Theresienstadt. And they were uh, with this uh, threat of death every day, because every day there were new transports to Auschwitz, and no one knew whether they'll remain alive or not. And under these circumstances, we have this artist that depicts the faces of these men and women and tells us a bit about their lives. And if you look closely at the portraits, you'll see every time it's a profile, so of course he could draw more quickly a profile in a humoristic style, and you'll see the signature of the person that was portrayed. So here it's Franz Eugen Klein, who was a famous musician uh, from Vienna. And he not only signed this portrait, he added some notes from Tosca. Tosca was uh, um, performed in Theresienstadt. Uh, this opera was performed there. And uh, he wrote a quote from there. So he's able to joke at his portrait. And we have the exact date. It's the 12th of September, 1943. A few months later, Franz Eugen Klein was deported to Auschwitz and he never came back. Victor Ullmann, another musician, also active in Vienna. He was also active in Prague. And he, uh, Victor Ullmann writes about himself, it's like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. So they are able to joke about themselves, but let's think what it means for, for a man to, 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 to depict his friends like that. And what is so interesting, and here I would like to talk maybe a bit more about uh, the theme of portraits during the time of the Holocaust, because what we see, it's not just Max Placzek depicting uh, his friends and the cultural community of Theresienstadt. There we see the same phenomenon going on throughout uh, Europe in the different places where the Jewish artists were interned. So in ghettos, in uh, concentration camps, or in labor camps. Every time the artists had the opportunity, they would leave a trace of their brethren, they would leave a whole series of portraits. And what we understand is that what they were doing it was just fighting spiritually with the, I mean, with the tools they had. So just a pencil and a piece of paper. They fought against the process of dehumanization and they fought against the process of annihilation. Because once they left these portraits, we have a visual recording of the people, of the prisoners living in these places. But not only that, through the face, the artist restore these women and men and children, they restore them their sense of individuality. And today, we are able to look at all these faces and 
bring them back to their dignity. So, so when we talk about spiritual resistance, I think that the act of portraying during the time of the Holocaust was really an act of spiritual resistance. Um, Max Blachek was uh, deported to Auschwitz and from there to Sachsenhausen and he was ultimately uh, murdered. So these last portraits of most of the people that he drew because most of the people he portrayed were murdered, they form, uh, a, I would say, a one big portrait of an entire community that was exterminated by the Nazis. Now we will go to a special gallery dedicated to the artist Carol Deutsch, where we will see a beautiful Bible created in occupied Belgium between 1941 and 1942. What you can see here is a special Bible that Carol Deutsch created in occupied Belgium between 1941 and 1942, and you can see it is signed and dated. On both, on both sides of this wooden box that Carol Deutsch created. All around you'll see ornamentation for, with the two most important Jewish symbols. You have on one side the Star of David, on the other side you have the ancient Jewish symbol, the menorah, the seven-branched candelabra. And all, the, all around you have the Hebrew alphabet, not only the one we are using today, also the one we know from archaeology, the ancient Hebrew alphabet. Now I would like to talk to you a bit about Karl Deutsch, the artist. Who was he? Why did he create this Bible? So for that I would like to invite you to look at this painting. So this painting was done much before that the Bible was created by Karl Deutsch and it's from the beginning of Karl Deutsch as an artist. Karl Deutsch was born in Belgium to an Orthodox family in Antwerp. And nothing in his education prepared him to be an artist. Actually, he was supposed to be in the diamond business like the rest of his family. He was married uh, at a very young age, as a you know, Shidduch, and he went to Ostende where his wife came from. So in Ostende, there was a famous painter by the name of James Ansel, one of the most important Belgian painters. Uh, and there, through the influence of James Ansel, he decided he wanted to become a painter. And at first he depicted landscapes of the city, so you can see Ostende, it's typical view uh, of the place and he depicted portraits and uh, later on um, he traveled, he had some problem in, problems in his marriage, he traveled to the land of Israel, he went back to Belgium, he divorced from his uh, first wife married the love of his life, Fela, and in 1940 they had a child whose name was Ingrid. She was born in January 1940. A few months later, Belgium was occupied and the family had to find a way to survive. Karl Deutsch tried to obtain visas to the United States but it didn't succeed. So when the situation became too dangerous, they went into hiding. They split. The girl went into hiding with her grandmother 
in a um, uh, Catholic uh, family and they survived by Karol Deutsch and his wife Fela went to a different place. They were probably denounced and taken to Auschwitz where Fela was murdered and Karol Deutsch was sent to other camps and he died of exhaustion before liberation. So the Bible we are talking about today was done between 1941 and 42, and it was given as a present to his child, Ingrid, for her second birthday. It's quite, uh, I would say, surprising that a man, a father, would give his child, two years old, you know, such, uh, such paintings, and not what we would have in mind, maybe Mickey Mouse or something of the fairy tales. But what we see here is the desire of this man who uh, brought, who had uh, a very strong religious education to give his daughter a legacy, to tell her we belong to the Jewish people, we belong to these people that gave the Bible to the world. I want you to learn the stories of our ancestors, how they were able to survive the tribulations uh, of Pharaoh and, and of others. And I think there is so much hope in this beautiful gift of a father to his child. So I think everything he wanted to tell her, he put in these paintings. And of course, these paintings, everyone can learn from them at another level uh, and in each stage of his life. And, and so uh, after Ingrid survived, while her parents did not, the only thing almost that was left from her parents was this Bible, this legacy. And through these works, we are able to tell, first of all, the story of Karo Deutsch, but also to tell the story of a Jewish father fighting also, again, it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual fight because when, when everything related to Judaism is being annihilated at this time in Europe, he uh, affirms in a very strong way his belonging to the Jewish people and to its legacy. Now I would like to talk to you about Felix Nussbaum, who is one of the most important artists when we are talking about the art from the Holocaust. Felix Nussbaum was born in Osnabrück in Germany in 1904 and uh, he was very talented, he was encouraged to pursue his art, and um, he received a scholarship to study in Rome. And then, well, while he was there in Italy, the Nazis came to power, and he immediately understood he had no future again in Germany. So he started going from one place to the other in Europe, until he settled in Belgium, like Karl Deutsch. And um, in 1939, he depicts this painting, uh, The Refugee. And what we see here is a man full of despair. We can see it through his body language. We can see his face because it's covered by his hands. He, this man is in some kind of a prison cell, but this prison is open, the gate is open, but let's look what awaits this man if he goes out. Only death, symbolized by dead trees and blackbirds. So, and the blackbirds are a recurrent motif in Felix Nussbaum's uh, paintings and of course they signify a bad omen, they signify death. Uh, now if we look 
at the center of this painting is this globe, this huge globe, completely disproportionate. And the whole world is in front of this man, but there's no place for the Jews. This painting was done after the Evian conference, where uh, the fate of the Jews was being debated by all of the countries. And the conclusion of this conference was that no one wanted the Jews. So Felix Nussbaum, as a German Jew, expresses the despair of the German and Austrian Jews at the time through this painting. What he depicts is completely universal. It's the despair of the refugee. But at the same time, it's his own personal story. Now look at the bundle and stick that are close to this man that sits um, in, in sadness. We learn from these two elements that this man, this refugee, has been already to different places, like Felix Nussbaum. He has found no home, no country to accept him. Felix Nussbaum and his wife were living in Belgium when it was occupied. As a foreigner, Nussbaum was arrested, taken to the camp of Saint-Cyprien in the south of France. He managed to escape. He went back to Brussels. And with his wife, Fela, they went into hiding. There, while in hiding, Felix Nussbaum continued to paint. Actually, he painted like never before. He gave a voice to the persecution of the Jews at this time. And he left amazing paintings telling about what it meant for a man to be dehumanized and to be persecuted having great awareness of what was going on, he took photographs of his paintings and in order to leave a trace. And he took the most important paintings he gave to friends of his, or people he considered friends, for safekeeping. Um, on July 1944, he and his wife were arrested and they were taken to Auschwitz. On the last transport from Belgium to Auschwitz, Felka and Felix Nussbaum were both murdered in Auschwitz. So all that was left from this unique artist are his artworks. But thanks to these artworks that survived, we have a very powerful testimony of what it meant to live as a Jew during these dreadful times. After liberation, the very few artists who did survive needed to find the strength to carry on. And we'll see how art helped them toward this return to life. This is the very first painting done by Pinchas Sha'ar after liberation in 1945 while he is in a sanatorium recovering from the trauma of the Holocaust. What we see here is a man in despair. Actually, it reminds us a bit of Felix Nussbaum's refugee. We have the same body language of, of uh, you know, a man that is completely tired. Uh, we have the bundle. So again, it takes us to uh, the iconographic uh, tradition of the wandering Jew a man having nowhere to go, because we have to bear in mind all the Jews who survived the Holocaust, they had no home, no family, nowhere to go. So this is their story. And Pinchas Shah 
tells that he was that man. He was in such a state of complete anguish and despair, not having, uh, you know, the basic energy to go back and resume his life. He was in a sanatorium, he had to recover, and there he was completely broken, having no taste for life or anything. One day, a nurse came to him and asked him questions about him. She asked who he was, who he was before the war, what he did. So he said that what seemed to him like ages ago, he was a painter in Lodge. He was studying with Stominski, one of the leading avant-garde artists in Poland. And, you know, she encouraged him to talk. And three days later, she came with a boy and painting materials. And she left these next to his bed. At first, he didn't know what to do. But then he started painting. And this is what he painting. It's as if he took all of his feelings and put them in one painting. And he said that this painting brought him back to life. It was as if the physical act of painting took him back to his former life, to his former self, and through this he could build himself anew. And we know this, this story because this story was told by Elie Wiesel, who was a friend of Pinchas Sha'ar, while Pinchas Sha'ar lived in New York. Elie Wiesel wrote this beautiful story of recovery in one of the four words of Pinchas Sha'ar's um, catalogs. Um, for an exhibition. And what is so interesting is that Pinchas Cha'a, after this one very sad painting, only um, painted in bright and colorful, uh, um, you know, uh, paint, paint, and he also uh, only had happy subjects, Jewish subject, biblical subjects, uh, but nothing in his art could disclose the fact he had been through such difficult times as a Holocaust survivor. So what we see here actually is the power of art to uh, bring back the individuality of a person and also to um, inspire him and maintain his spirit alive. There is still one special story I would like to share with you. And for this, I would like to invite Jeremy Weiss, director of the US desk, to join me. Jeremy, the reason I wanted to show you this special uh, drawing uh, is because it's connected to our current situation. Henri Kishka uh, depicted, you can recognize it easily, you know, right. the Seven Dwarfs, right. and uh, of course it was a very popular movie at the time. It was released in 1937, and uh, he, it had a great impact on the youth. And Henri Kishka, who lived in Belgium, uh, was inspired by this story, and in time of great sadness and despair, and not uh, in occupied Belgium, and not just before the deportations, he found refuge in the world of fantasy, and he depicted what he had seen in the movies. Uh, later on, all of his family were deported. He was in nine camps and he's the only survivor from his whole family. Amazing. And when he came back, he just gathered a few things from his past home, and one of these was this drawing. He didn't become a painter later on, even though he always liked 
a painting. He was in the Schmattis business, you know, it's a cloak business. And how did this come to our Yad Vashem? And oh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, I learned about uh, the existence of this beautiful drawing. Uh, and I contacted Yaron, uh, one of Henri's uh, um, grandchildren, and, and I asked him, would you like to donate it to our collection? And he told me, you know what, I cannot, because it's the reason I wake up in the morning every day. And later, a few years later, we received a phone call and he said he wanted to donate it. So I asked him what happened and he said, you know, after I saw your conservation lab, after I saw how you keep the works in Yad Vashem, I know it has to be here because I want it to stay for posterity. Now, what um, happened to Henri? Exactly. Henri passed away a few days ago uh, in Brussels. He died from the coronavirus. And Michel, who is his son and who is a famous cartoonist, said what a microscopic virus was able to achieve the whole uh, Nazi army was not able to do. And it's really the occasion for us to pay tribute to Henri Kishka and all of the survivors that are still living among us. Um, we owe them so much. Absolutely. Fascinating. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that every time I come into the uh, museum here, the art museum, and I hear your presentations and lectures, it strengthens my commitment to Yad Vashem and to what we do. Um, the importance comes out of this voice that these artists uh, uh, gave us in a way. So thank you very much. I do have several questions if we have the time, maybe one or two questions. Pleasure. Okay. Uh, one question is, you know, these painters, these artists express themselves spiritually when there was so much death around there and hunger and violence, how did they find the ability, the internal ability to paint? How did, could they find that spiritual moment to do so? And logistically, how did they find the materials, the brushes, the paper? Could you share that with us? Well, this is fascinating. It's a fascinating question. And actually, uh, I am all the time amazed, you know, how did they find? It's not that we have one answer, because when you look at what they did, it's so inspiring, and it's just um, filling us with, with awe and respect and, and admiration. But maybe I can uh, try to answer that through, and, 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 and both of your questions through some of our artworks. I'd love that, thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, so I think that art for the artists uh, really played different roles. Uh, first of all, the artists wanted to leave a trace of, of what they, they, they wanted to commemorate. They, they are aware of their role. So in some cases, they, they leave the artworks as documents and, and it gives them a sense of meaning. And we know already from Viktor Frankl and if there was a meaning, then there was a way. Uh, and the meaning of life and of Frankl. Meaning, yeah, w w a goal. So, so to, to document, to leave a trace, to express the voice of all the victims uh, around them, that was a purpose. And so that's what, in lots of cases, that's what gave them the power to do so. Uh, but here I wanted to show you uh, this artist. His name is uh, André Blondel. He was born as Chaya Blondel. And he was active in the south of France. He found hiding in, he was hiding in a cabin, in a log cabin. And he had to do a physical work uh, to which he was not accustomed because he was a painter and all of a sudden it was uh, so difficult. And, and he said that here, we, we are, every day brings with it its share of new difficulties. 
if it were not for the ecstasy and rapture that overflow within me when I hold a paintbrush, I would be unable to do anything. And he writes it in his diary, 1943. And so here it gives us an answer because for us it's a paradox. How were they able to paint when they were uh, fighting for the um, physical survival? But here we have the answer. Right. For them it was essential. It was essential. Right. This is what maintained them alive because they kept their spirits alive so they were able to also to survive, you see? Okay. And about the actual ability to find colors yeah. and materials to paint with? So this, I would like to address that question with this uh, particular painting. This is Chivis, who was active in the Lodge ghetto. He did survive the war. And uh, there, he did not have painting materials. So he created his own ones. He just took a potato sack, he transformed it into a canvas, that's what you see here. Uh, and he didn't have painting materials, so he invented a new technique. He took industrial paint, pigments, uh, aniline, he mixed it together, and it created this very grainy, bluish, um, paint and so it shows us how the artists were even lacking basic materials but could find their way to find the commitment their, their creativity, creativity was was there to invent and overcome and and this is one example that every time uh, it's true for all of the works we have in the collection we have to ask ourselves how did they find the painting materials? And sometimes the story will be, well, uh, a friend of them supplied them with the painting materials, or um, they were able to uh, exchange for a small portion of food or something like that. And so each time we have a different story, but you'll, maybe you'll also notice that most of the works in our collection are on paper because to obtain painting materials and a canvas, it was very rare in the conditions of the ghetto or, uh, you know, labor camps, yeah. I could go on listening to you for hours. I thank you very, very much for this very moving and fascinating presentation. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for joining me today. Um, you've seen only a few highlights from our unique collection of art that was created during the time of the Holocaust. Uh, I hope that the amazing stories that we've seen today will inspire you. Thank you, and we're wishing you from Jerusalem Yad Vashem all the very best and lots of health, and hope to see you soon here at Yad Vashem. <laughs>